turning to today. Most of us are familiar with um, admissions tests um, and how they are used in this country, the ACT and the SAT. In Wisconsin, I think most students are familiar with the ACT and take the ACT. And as a matter of fact, I believe this year high school students are, um, all high school students in the state of Wisconsin will be taking the ACT. Um, but uh, how well do these tests, um, you know, predict future college success or even first year college success? And how fair are the test questions and how equitable are the test questions when it comes to how these tests are used, especially uh, given the fact that these tests are administered to so many students from various backgrounds and with different perspectives. Um, and why have 100 or more colleges uh, opted out completely of admissions tests or de-emphasized admission tests in their admissions processes. Um, including, I, I, I looked up Beloit College here in Wisconsin, Plymouth State University, which is a state university in New Hampshire, and um, Temple, among the most recent. Um, so, and how do these uh, issues around test equity and test fairness relate to affirmative action and basketball coaches? <laughs> So today we have Jay Rosner who will talk about these three things and link them together, he promises. So, um, so we'll see, that should be cool. Um, Jay Rosner's work ranges from research on test question selection methods to providing test prep, um, uh, um, uh, test prep for underrepresented minority students through his work with the um, foundation that he's a part of. The, um, why am I blanking on the, the name of the, the Princeton <laughs> Review Foundation? Who's heard of the Princeton <laughs> Review, right? Um, Jay regularly does collaborative programs with organizations such as the Cherokee Nation Foundation, the Hispanic Scholarship Fund, the UNCF, and NABC. The NABC is the National Association of Basketball Coaches. He's delivered expert witness testimony on admissions testing in the landmark Grutter University of Michigan Law School Supreme Court Affirmative Action case. More recently, he engineered an amicus brief in the Fisher Affirmative Action case filed by the National Association of Basketball Coaches. His talk today is entitled Destabilizing the Bubbles, Admissions Tests, Affirmative Action, and Basketball Coaches. So we'll talk for about 30, he'll talk for about 30 minutes and we'll have time for Q&A. And, &A and um, so make yourself welcome and join me in saying hello to Jay. Thank you, Jason. It's a pleasure to be here. I do a number of these presentations, and each time I do one, I want to add a few things to uh, uh, keep me a little bit off balance and thinking. And destabilizing is the first time I've used that word. Uh, and I've been thinking uh, for the last 24 hours of the stability and instability of bubbles and bubble tests. And uh, if you want to meditate on that a little bit, you can. Uh, but let's get right into this. The, uh, I'll give you a little overview of what I'm going to talk about. I'll, I have one slide on the Princeton Review Foundation so you can have a sense of what I do uh, in just a little bit more detail than Jason presented. And then I'll do about 15 or 20 minutes on my own research, uh, what I've added to, to the discussion which is uh, some research on test question selection that I've done. Uh, there are a couple of news items that I think are relevant to the three topics that I have. Um, I'll make some comments on affirmative action and then talk a little bit about uh, the basketball coaches, or if you like, a lot about the basketball coaches, depending on your interests. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, the Princeton Review Foundation, uh, it's a 501c3 and, and Jason um, uh, gave you a little overview of what I do. I do a lot of workshops for admissions officers uh, and a lot of presentations at their conferences. Um, Jason, you referred to the use of standardized tests. Uh, I would have referred to the misuse of standardized tests, but that's my orientation. And back to destabilization, I'm actually interested in destabilizing the bubble tests. That's one of my missions, just to be clear. Um, they happen to be bubble tests and bubble test scores among the most stable things in education. 
Um, and one could argue, no, they're not stable. In fact, they're growing. Uh, and, and there are countervailing movements also, the test optional colleges being some. I uh, work with and talk about uh, all of these bubble tests, the whole alphabet soup of uh, college admissions to, to the main graduate and professional school admissions tests. And I have great partners, um, and Jason mentioned some of them. Um, CNF is the Cherokee Nation Foundation, SAP is the Choctaw Scholarship Advisement Program. And um, more recently what I've done is uh, my, my, uh, a summary of my research was published in the book SAT Wars. Uh, it's a chapter in that book um, edited by Joseph Suarez of Wake Forest. And Wake Forest is another test optional uh, university. Uh, and, uh, well, I, and I should say that um, uh, Joseph Suarez uh, is a professor of political science at Wake and was the driving force in Wake becoming test optional. And um, I was flattered that he thought that my, re my research was an integral part and, and should be included in the test optional conversation. The uh, amicus brief uh, that Jason referred to is, is an interesting one. I didn't write it. I'm a lawyer, but a law professor at the University of Pennsylvania wrote it. And uh, you, can, you can Google and find it if you're, if you're interested in sports. It weaves together the history of racism in sports with the history of racism and affirmative action on university campuses in what I think is a, is a very interesting way. So that's something for you to check out if you're interested. Let me jump into my research. I have about 15 slides here that I'll go through pretty quickly to give you uh, a, an overview of my test question selection uh, uh, research and conclusions. So about, uh, I, and I'm talking about SAT data. I would talk about ACT data, but I can't get any. And I've, I've requested it. Um, and I purchased this SAT data uh, back in the early 2000s when it was publicly available. And since then, the program has been shut down. And I've been told that I specifically can't have any more data. So that's, that's how the testing companies treat the openness and transparency of discussion in, in education. Um, so uh, October is one of the largest administrations. About 400,000 students take the October SAT every year. So I bought two data sets from ETS, which is the test developer of the SAT, um, each of which contains item level data. And I have the word item uh, in boldface. Item means test question. So if you hear me lapse into a jargon uh, by saying item, you know that I'm talking about a test question. A test item is a test question. So uh, for 100,000 randomly chosen students from each of those two administrations, I have all their answers to all the test questions, and I have the student descriptive <coughs> questionnaire data, which is race, gender, ethnicity, et cetera. So I had a professor at Emory University, uh, Marty Shapiro, crunch the data for me. And so what I can do is for each item, for each test question, I can calculate the percentage of black students, uh, white students, female students, male students who get each question, who answer each question correctly. Does that make sense? It's a very simple process. Um, often when people understand, uh, try to misunderstand this process, they're looking for too much. Um, this is just a very basic putting together two pieces of data, say gender and the student's answers, and then calculating the percentage of females who got a particular question, question 14, uh, correct. Does this make sense? Any questions about that? Okay, it's, it's very straightforward. So um, I'm now going to uh, present to you a little comparison between male performance on the SAT and female performance on the SAT with specific regard to math questions. Just going to talk about math questions now. 
So a couple of uh, terms that I'll define for you so that you can understand this discussion. Um, and pretesting is one of those terms. So every new SAT question that's generated goes in a section of the test where it's pretested. That section does not count in the student's score. So all students get either an extra math section or verbal section or writing section on the SAT. They don't know which one it is because it looks like all the other sections. And that's where questions are pretested because the testing company, ETS, wants to get the data from students who answer that question, analyze the data, and see if that question is acceptable to be used on a future test on a scored section. All right? So that's pretesting, tried out in an unscored section. Uh, and then selected for future use, rejected for future use, or modified and retested to see if it's acceptable for future use. Uh, and I've, th so that's common terminology. These are terms that I've developed, so you won't see them anywhere else in the literature unless, there's, you know, unless it's a discussion of my work. Uh, and a male-female comparison situation uh, a male preference question is simply the percentage of males answering correctly is higher than the percentage of females answering correctly. There's the opposite concept, a female preference question, where the percentage of females answered correctly higher than the percentage of males. There's also, I didn't have it up here, a no preference question, where 37% of males answered correctly, 37% of females answered correctly. That's a no preference question. Is everybody clear on these terms? Pretty simple. So, I knew you all were coming here because you saw a testing. You wanted to see test questions. I can sense that. So I'm going to hit you with a test question. Uh, I, the answer is B. I don't want you actually thinking about, well, how? Because you're, <laughs> you're all nerds and geeks, and, you'll, and you're still trying to calculate, well, how did he get B? But what I'd like you to think about is, is this a male or female preference question? Who's doing better on this question? That's the, issue. That's the important issue. B is the correct answer, and I can show you how to do it. It's not that important. So I'll give you a few seconds to ruminate on that, even though you're still thinking about how to figure out the answer. And then I'll take a little poll. We'll see what you think. OK, you've had plenty of time. How many think it's a male preference question? Hands? Female preference question? Hands? No preference, confused, I don't know, hungry, those hands? OK. <laughs> Um, it's actually a female preference question by only 1%, and you would think, and you know, very high percentages of students got this correct. Uh, as you can see, it's testing an important concept in math. What? <laughs> but it's, it's generating good statistics, which is what's important about an SAT question, not the content. Is it generating the kind of statistics that the test developers want? So, uh, you're all thinking, or should be thinking, ah, eh, 1%, what's that? You know, it's, it's hardly significant. You'll see the significance in a moment. So, um, I'm now going to talk about the whole data set, the two tests. Um, and there are 60 math questions on each test. Um, I should mention the SAT uh, changed a little bit in 2005, and there's a slightly different number of math questions on the test, just so you know. But back then, there were 60 math questions on each test. So I have data on 120 questions. I know for 120 questions, male preference, female preference, no preference. I know all that. Calculated that. So uh, my question for you is how many male preference questions, how many female preference questions, and I'll give you a couple of hints. Three are no preference questions. So we'll take them out. And all the rest, 117, go one way or the other, if you're following me. So uh, I'm going to, and males score higher. So you would assume that more than half of those remaining questions, which are either male preference or female preference, would be male preference questions. And you'd be right. So there are, it's 58 and a half is, <coughs> if I did the, the division right, is, is uh, would be half. So give me a number of female preference questions lower than 58, because the male number is higher than 58. Everybody following? You know, just yell out a number, but if, if you yell a number above 58, you're not, you weren't listening. <laughs> 
the low 58. 50. Pessimist. <laughs> <laughs> or a realist. Or a realist. <laughs> <laughs> Any other numbers? Okay, you ready for the correct answer? I showed it to you. I was trying to help you out. Okay, number of male preference questions, if someone can subtract. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, and you might think about, uh, and of course, the reason this is done for the women who are here is we males are pathetic at math and we need this kind of help, right? Because they pretest the questions. And this isn't happenstance, this is design. These questions are chosen. They have all this data before they choose the questions to appear on the scored sections of the test. Here's the distribution. This is the question I showed you because I was trying to help you out. That was the female preference question. These are the three no preference questions. And then everything else favors us males because we need the help, you know, and we would be pathetic on this otherwise. Um, with the average being, average difference being somewhere uh, around 7%. And some questions having really, you know, a bunch of questions having double digit differences in uh, males, uh, correct? And this is just a subtraction of the percentage. For example, uh, a 7% question, just a 7% uh, difference, for example, is simply males, 57% of the males answer correctly, and 50% of females are answering correctly. That's all, just a subtraction. Okay? Everybody's good with that? That's the SAT math. Um, now we'll go to, I'll do, not, instead of a male-female uh, comparison, I'll do a white Mexican-American comparison using Mexican-American uh, as, um, uh, to represent Latino because in these data, data sets there were three or four Latino categories with Mexican-American being by far the largest. So the, it's just simplest to use that as a proxy for Latino. So you'll forgive me for, for doing that, but it made everything much, much easier. Uh, and I welcome you to go into the data and, and, and do the hydraulics to try to figure out all those four cat categories, but this is, this is the easiest. So here we have uh, what's called a sentence completion question from the data set. Um, and I could tell you the correct answer or I could have you tell me what the correct answer is. Let's see if we have any, I'll, I'll be silent for a few seconds to see if we have any volunteers and then I'll tell you, because that's not what's important. I want you to tell me whether this is a white or Mexican-American preference question. <laughs> so, have I, I've made you cynical already, haven't I? Well, that's part of the risk. Correct answer is C since no one yelled it out. You're all kind of shy, and it's nice, okay. And, uh, but, but the, as I said, the important question is, is this a white preference question or Mexican-American preference question? I'll give you a couple seconds to ponder that. Okay, let's see some hands. How many think it's a white preference question? I think a Mexican-American preference question? No preference, confused, tired, okay. It's a Mexican-American preference question. By a small amount, 49% of Mexican-American kids got this right, 46% of whites. So let's go back to the data set. And now I'm talking about math and verbal, not just math. So I have a lot more questions. I have 276 questions, the total number of questions on both tests. And uh, of course, I know how many are Mexican-American preference questions and how many are white preference questions. A couple of hints. One is a no preference question, so I toss that out, and I'm left with 275 questions that go one way or the other, and whites score higher. Um, so you would expect more than half to be white preference questions, and you'd be right. Um, so give me a number below 137 for the number of Mexican-American preference questions. Yell it out. 
<laughs> so I've made you all pessimists already. Okay, and the answer is one. That's the one I showed you. And the number of white preference questions is? All right, okay. So everybody's comfortable with that. Uh, and here's the distribution. That's the question I showed you. That's the no preference question. These are the differences. Remember, this is design. This is not happenstance. Uh, the test developer has this data before choosing these questions for the test. And the average difference is in the, the 12, is actually double di digits here. It's in the 11 to 12 percent range. And let's go to a white and black preference question comparison. Uh, here's a question that's, again, a sentence completion question with two blanks. Um, I'll, I'll wait a few uncomfortable seconds for someone to yell out the correct answer, and then I'll give it to you, because that's not what's important. I want you to raise your hand for white or black in terms of white or black preference question. So the correct answer is? And this is hard to do, by the way. I'm, I'm really good at these tests, but I'm used to answering them like this, hunched over with a pencil and a paper. To look up on the screen, it's actually disorienting for me, and I miss questions that I shouldn't miss, um, just to let you know. Correct answer is C. That's not important. What's important is, is it a white or black preference question? I'll give you a few seconds to contemplate that, and then I'll see how cynical I've made you. Okay, how many think it's a white preference question? Raise your hands. Black preference question. <laughs> undecided, still undecided. <laughs> okay, this is a black preference question with an 8% gap uh, between whites and blacks in favor of, uh, of black students on this. So we'll go back to the whole data set. Remember the 276 questions? How many black preference questions? How many white preference questions? There are no no preference questions um, in this analysis. So we're dealing with all 276. White score higher. Give me a number below 138 for the number of black preference questions. <laughs> I've trained you well, but that's not the correct answer. Anybody come up with an answer other than one? You're optimists. Zero. Can somebody explain what I showed you? The, the question about turnout. Yes. Very good. So there are black preference questions. They just don't make it to the scored section of the test. OK? And the number of white preference questions? Yes, that's right. OK, and here's the distribution there. There were no no preference questions, so there are no negatives here. And these are the number of questions, uh, number of questions on both tests. Uh, and notice we have a couple of 30% gap questions chosen for the test, even though the test developers have that data before they choose the question. So who can tell folks? Um, explain to non-basketball fans uh, the general principle. There are lots of crazy details. But what's the general principle behind the NBA draft? Can someone explain it to us? Yes. The worst teams get the highest pick. Yes. The worst teams get the best players. Um, so you have professional uh, basketball teams deciding among themselves which of the college basketball players they're going to choose in their draft. And because the NBA is interested in competitiveness, they're interested in equity, in a way, between the teams because they want competitive games. If, if your NBA team beat the other team by 40 points night in and night out, like after a while, nobody would go to the games. It's just not that exciting. So they want competitive games. And so think about it. If they allowed the best team, the championship team, to have the best select the selection of the best college players, the gaps would grow, and the league would become less competitive. Everybody with me on that? So it's generally there. They have other uh, um, 
rules that modify this slightly, but the general principle is as was stated. The worst team gets the first selection of the best college player because that way there's an equity possibility, you know, an improvement and comp competitive uh, possibility. Does that make sense to everybody? Well, the testing realm operates in the reverse of that, in that the best student gets the most desirable question. And you saw the reverse of that shown in the last uh, set of slides because the question that favored black students got tossed out. So here's the way I was, uh, this, I'm quoting myself in the Nation magazine because they forced me to do this and, it, and this was the most concise description I could come up with as to why this process works. So the key words here, I think, are internally reinforcing cycle. This is what happens over and over again, and it's this process that produces the data about different group, subgroup performance that I showed you. So that's, that's my uh, test question selection uh, um, research in a nutshell, and just a few conclusions. All SAT questions capture something about race and gender, and 99% of the time, it's invisible. Um, I actually have a reluctance to show you that talisman question. Remember the white Mexican-American question? Because when I saw that, I thought, talisman, you know, that, that might, there might be something there that Mexican-American kids would relate to a little better than white kids. I had a hypothesis on that. I can't develop a hypothesis in even 1% of SAT questions. And unless any of you have taught SAT prep, has, has anyone here taught SAT prep? Sometimes, okay. It's, then I'm confident to say that I've seen more SAT questions than all of you put together squared, because I've been doing SAT prep stuff for 25 years. And I, I look at questions, and as I said, 1%, only 1% 1 of the questions can I even develop a hypothesis, and I'm wrong sometimes. So this is stuff you can't see. Orsman Regatta was a classic criticism back in the 1970s when they had questions like that on the test. Orsman Regatta, and people could say, oh my goodness, it's obviously biased toward New England prep school kids, because who else knows what an Orsman is? Uh, or Regatta, and, and people know what an Orsman is, who else knows what a Regatta is? But those are gone. And all of this stuff operates in a way that you can't see it, okay? And, and that's why I said that talisman question is a, is a, is a little bit of an exception to the rule. Um, group score differences are, are, are not generated when students sit down to take the test. It's a foregone conclusion by then. They're generated when the, when the questions are selected. Uh, black preference questions are always eliminated after pre-testing. And as you can see, Mexican-American pre preference questions are for the most part eliminated, and questions favoring females on math are for the most part eliminated. Um, and you can call that what you will. I've been thinking segregation uh, uh, recently. And this is common to all bubble tests. What I'm actually doing is I'm presenting to you a critique of psychometrics. Psychometrics is the science of test con development and construction um, done by psychometricians, whom we uh, lovingly refer to as psychos. That's a cheap laugh line. Um, <laughs> but this is, this, these, what I just showed you is common to all bubble tests. Um, and so I call the SAT a white preference test that's actually built by selecting white preference questions. And I have a great uh, story about the ethnic passage if we have time at the end. But let me get to a few other things. Let me do a time check, Jason. It's just about 12 minutes. Close to half an hour? Okay, let me just, I have uh, six or seven or eight more slides that I could go through about affirmative action and basketball coaches and stuff. And, and, and I'll get to them, but let me pause here to see if there are questions or comments uh, or if there's a discussion 
from what I just showed you. Yes. I'm, yes, first and then second. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering. I mean, I've, I've seen some webinars and read about um, stereotype threat and how with tests like this, at one point in time, I think the demographic questions were at the beginning, you yeah. know, and maybe more recently they've moved them to the end. I mean, in, in the data that you were looking at, were there things like that that could have also crept in to impact performance? Or? I, I done a lot of work with Claude Steele, who developed uh, uh, the concept of stereotype threat. I've been on a couple panels with mm -hmm. him. And um, so I've, I've, I'm uh, pretty knowledgeable about, about stereotype threat. There's some discussion uh, in, in the admissions testing community about when you ask race and ethnicity. And clearly, um, the desire is not to ask it right before the performance. Um, typically, what happens with the SAT and ACT is it's, it's, it's when you register, you know, so it's done a month before. And so I don't think that that connection is particularly acute. Um, my sense is stereotype threat adds, this is, this is a process that um, helps either produce or maintain the gaps, depending on how you look at it. And stereotype threat is an independent process that also produces uh, its own gaps. And those, are, those, those actually are, I think, um, separate forces, um, probably somewhat uh, a little bit interrelated, but not a whole lot. Uh, but that, you, you raise an issue that's definitely in play. Anytime you think about uh, score gaps, you really have to analyze the impact of stereotype threat. Okay, and stereotype threat, for those of you who've never heard of it, um, is, I will try a short description. Um, stereotype threat occurs when a person who's a member of a group uh, is aware of his or her group's um, subpar performance in a particular domain. And that person is, then becomes concerned about affirming that stereotype, even if they think they personally aren't part of, uh, uh, aren't uh, a subpar performer in whatever realm we're talking about. So that's the pernicious aspect. It affects even folks who are strong in the domain that's being, being tested. Not, not just folks who are weak in that domain. So thank you for, for, for raising that. Yeah, so I had a question about, um, you, you mentioned a couple times that the people that are selecting the questions have access to this data. Yes. Um, and so. Well, they specifically collect the data through pre-testing. Okay, right. And so, and they cut the data to have, to see by race or by gender or sex, mm -hmm. how they're scoring when, they, when determining which questions to select. Well, sort of. They have this data. I'm not sure they look at it that intensely. What they do do, uh, uh, I was going to explain by serial correlation. Do you want to do the explanation? No, you can go ahead and explain by serial. That's fine. Okay. I'll, I'll chime in then as far as what they do do. Oh, great, yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. So the process that the test company uses is they gather the data from pre-testing and then they use a method that's called point by serial correlation, which sounds jargony, but it's not a, not a difficult concept at, at, at its base. By serial correlation is that you want the profile of students of the group answering each individual question to mirror the profile of students who uh, answering all the questions. In other words, the students who do strongest on the test, you want them to tend to get that question correct for all the questions. And that's, I did the paragraph that I had up there from the Nation magazine, that was kind of my layperson's description of how points, point by serial correlation works. So that's what they're looking at. The race and gender uh, and ethnicity stuff, they have a different process called DIFF that I, I can explain. It's, did you want to get into that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, well, and I was, I was going to start to get into that a little bit, too. Yeah, so yeah. so uh, they're actually not really fitting by serials. I mean, that, that's not really something. They, they may look at them. The by serials are really used because they're much easier to communicate with lay audiences. So 
you know, if they're bringing in a group of item developers or something like that, and they want to try to communicate a little bit about, about how some of these items are working, they might use a point by serial. They're really fitting models. Okay. Right? They're, they're fitting models um, uh, and looking at, at you know, model-based measures of difficulty, model-based measures yes. of, of discrimination. Right. Uh, and different based, categories of in, items. In different categories. And there are, you know, there's certainly a, a correlation between, you know, an RPDI, a point by serial, and a, a discrimination index, a model-based discrimination index. But they are, uh, they are doing things a little bit differently. Um, and, and in terms of the question, you know, are they looking at uh, the, the difference between, you know, different groups in particular, you know, black-white differences, male-female differences? Uh, the answer to that is absolutely. Uh, they're absolutely looking at that. In fact, uh, you know, I, I bet most people would probably be blown away if you, if you really understood the uh, extent to which testing companies not only look at those data, but also take efforts in advance uh, of the items ever ever even being pilot tested uh, to make sure that they are not um, you know that they're fair items that they're they're they've got you know uh, lots of item review committees that are looking at these items they're going through multiple layers uh, and and passing you know the the eye test uh, a number of different times before they ever get out there and the idea is that uh, there, there's an underlying construct right. That, that we're actually trying to measure with these tests. And, and the, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not at all surprised by anything that you found, and I'm also not at all worried. Um, and the reason that I'm not worried is that you're making an, a fundamental assumption, which I think is just false. Which is? Uh, which is uh, that, that, ev that, you know, any two subgroups that you come up with uh, are equivalent on the construct at the, at the point of testing. Um, mm -hmm. And if they are, you expect, uh, on average, the probability of one group, you know, if you just randomly divide the people into two groups, I would be very surprised if you didn't find that most of these items were answered, you know, by, you know, uh, that, that about half of them favored one group, half of them favored another group. Um, you know, there are, uh, I think, a variety of reasons uh, that, we could, that we could debate but um, I, I'm not at all convinced that these groups are always equivalent on the construct at the point of testing. Mm. Um, now we can say maybe they should be. Uh, we would like them to be. We can manufacture tests to make them gen to make them come out with test scores that show them to be, but mm. it doesn't actually mean that they are. Um, and so, um, yeah. So I, I get and and, and dip, we, when we look at, at item bias, when we you know with psychometricians, I'm a psychometrician. Uh, when when psychometricians look at um, uh, you know bias in in terms of testing items or as you say differential item function, we, we don't put up these graphs. We don't we don't care because those are making this assumption that the groups are are equivalent and should be equivalent. Uh, instead, what we're doing is something called differential item functioning, which is um, uh, it, I mean it's 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 uh, adjusting for pre-group differences, basically, for, for, uh, for pre-test differences. So, you know, a, an example, sort of taking it out of the politically charged realm that we're sort of dealing with here, um, imagine giving a math test, just a basic math test. Let's say we could all come together and, and develop a test that we felt was a, good, was a good math test, okay? And we gave it to eighth graders and we gave it to fifth graders. I expect you're going to find a big difference. I expect you're going to see a really big difference between those two groups. Does that mean the test is at, you know, at fault? Well, no. The test is sort of reflecting what's going on there between those two different groups in the population. Um, but using this method of differential item functioning, we can sort of adjust. We can say, okay, given, given the, the distribution uh, on that latent trait for the two different groups, after we sort of take that into account and we look at people who are of the same uh, magnitude on that latent trait. Uh, so based on their performance on other questions, uh, which we think measure the construct well, uh, these guys are equivalent. Now let's look at how they do on this particular item. You know, we think they're equivalent overall. Are there differences on that particular item? Those are the sorts of tests that the psychometricians are doing. They're conditioning on, uh, you know, the, the 
we call it ability, which is a really unfortunate you know, term, but sort of the, the overall performance level um, uh, of, the, of the examinees, and it's those items. So when you showed me that, that item that <coughs> had a uh, sort of an eight point difference in an unanticipated direction, uh, I immediately thought, are you showing us pilot items, or what's because because that that just blows me away that there would be because I know that in the population there are really big one really big differences in the other direction and if we're seeing something that's showing that large of an advantage towards a group that in, in a, a, a direction that we don't expect that's actually I mean I would say that's bias right we try to avoid bias in both directions um, and um, not. You know, and, and, and try to develop a test that measures the underlying construct, and that's why there's a lot of work that goes into developing tests as far as specification of blueprints, uh, a lot of you know, expert judgments uh, about you know, what are the things that we should be measuring, and that's what we're trying to measure. Uh, but, but psychometricians certainly are not cherry-picking uh, items that, that you know, have preference for one group over another, um, and not developing tests in ways that that target one group or another, they're specifically actually excluding those types of items and, and just focusing on measuring the core underlying principles that they're interested in measuring. Yeah. And, and the difference that you and I have is that, you know, I point out that everything I showed you went through the very rigorous processes that were just described, and it's fair. Except I don't think so. <laughs> I don't agree with the fact that this is a fair process a rigorous process that generates fair results. Now, you did mention something that I think is, is um, uh, a little bit misleading in terms of my view, and that is I'm not assuming that the groups are of equal or parallel ability in any construct. What I am pointing out is that the differences are, in a sense, manufactured. You wouldn't use that word. You, you would use a different word, but that's from my perspective. And that if we chose questions a little bit differently, as was done on the Illinois insurance exam in the 1980s. Let me just make a, f a few comments on that. It's called the golden rule case. And it's the only case in, it's the only situation in which a bubble test was created where specifically questions were chosen from the questions pools with the smallest differences. And that was with the small, specifically white, black difference. And the quick explanation is a guy who owned an insurance company in Chicago um, had a situation where the insurance licensing tests were given after agents came in and worked for like three or six months. So this uh, insurance company owner would see the agents, see their work for a brief period of time and then they would go take the Illinois insurance exam. Well, what happened was he noticed that white agents um, who, whom he thought were pretty good and had good potential tended to pass the insurance exam. And white agents whom he thought weren't so good tended not to pass the insurance exam. And he was wrong sometimes, but he was, he was right most of the time. Black agents whom he thought weren't very good they didn't pass the Illinois exam, insurance exam. And black agents whom he thought were really good, they didn't pass. No black agents or very tiny percentage of black agents pass the Illinois insurance exam because the questions were selected. There were these gaps. And the settlement was to choose questions from the question pools with the smallest gaps, given some of the considerations you were talking about, the, the, the um, topic that was being tested and, and, and other considerations. That's the only time that was done. That was only done for like two years and then ETS had that insurance contract. They, they, they actually criticized their own settlement after that point, saying that for psychometric reasons that you pointed out, that this wasn't a good way to construct the test. Um, and, and I think that it's that kind of actually political consideration. Pure science will give you what you've seen. And what I'm saying is I think that is and should be politically unacceptable. And the science needs to be modified, adjusted, um, uh, changed in some way so that most of us would think that, that, that this was fair. 
I'm guessing that probably two thirds of the people in this room, if not more, would think that the, would think that the kind of data. Uh, maybe I should ask that question. How many people think that that's a that that that's a fair way to construct a test? Yeah. See, that's um, and and so that and that's my point that I think psycho the psychometric community is simply out of touch with a, with a wider public on this, if the public knew the information. Yeah? So, right, if the public knew the information. In fairness, you really haven't talked about how uh, College Board, SAT is a College Board assessment, uh, how College Board develops the test, all you've talked about is outcomes. And so the, yeah, really, no, we're not, really, but really the question, though, that, that you're posing is, are people comfortable with this outcome? And that's a very different question, mm -hmm. um, right? <laughs> Because um, Fair again, enough. I, I, I think that if people understood the test development process, um, uh, I, and I'm not saying that, that you know everyone would suddenly say this is fair, I'm not saying that at all, uh, but I think it would be, um, I, I think a lot of people would mm -hmm. say, oh wow, that's, that, that's really quite a process. I, I know we get that with our own, uh, so I, I'm director of our Center for Placement Testing, so we mm -hmm. have uh, a set of placement tests that we use throughout UW system to help students figure out what courses they should start taking when they come into UW system. Uh, and the folks who, uh, who develop the content are faculty in the discipline across UW system. We've got some high school uh, you know, folks who are on there too. Uh, and we rotate, uh, rotate it around. And, and overwhelmingly, when people come onto our committees, our development committees, uh, they are skeptical. Uh, they're, they're questioning um, you know certain aspects of the process, not necessarily based on based on data, based mostly on the fact that well these are multiple choice tests and you know I don't know what you can do with multiple choice tests. Um, and uh, after you know a year on the committee, they're like, wow, there's a lot more science to this and a lot more rigor to this than you know we ever could have imagined. And you know you guys are meticulous with respect to how you look for X, Y, and Z. Uh, and, and, you know, it's like talking to a completely different audience. Yeah, I, and I grant you rigor, and I grant you yeah. meticulousness. I just think that the process is, is not one that serves the public. It's that simple. I had a question. I had a question. With the psych, psych, psychometric, yeah. what did they look like? Who, who's putting together all these questions? Uh, the, the items themselves on, on all of these tests pretty much are developed by content experts. They're bringing in teams of, uh, you know, teams of uh, math teachers, mathematicians, uh, you know, English history, science uh, teachers, uh, uh, you know, I, I work uh, on like technical advisory panels for like physical therapy exams and the, the college board, um, you know, so I, I'm, they're bringing in specialists, you know, the people who actually really know this, who know, um, you know, in, in this case, there are a lot of people from universities also are sort of knowing, well, what is it that we're expecting of students uh, when they come to us? You know, what are the sorts of skills that we're interested in, in seeing in our incoming students? And we want to make sure that they're high with respect to those things. So, so uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's critically important, obviously, that the items themselves are, are written and the content specifications for an exam are developed by, uh, by experts, by people who really understand the domain uh, and, and know what are the, what are the things that they want, what are, what are the ways to, to tap that domain um, that are going to be most useful. But a lot of the experts are white. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I'll, he I'll help you out here. Uh, their ETS and the, the, the agencies manage to get psychometricians of color. It's pretty stunning. Uh, it's not all white. It's, it's a predominantly white. A profession, but there are psychometricians of color. But, but the, I mean, the, psycho, the psychometrics, though, is just is just the math part. But the, I mean, that's the model behind it. Uh, the, uh, the the real question is the content folks, right? The people who are developing the items, and uh, I mean, they're smart. They know it's a lawsuit waiting to happen if there isn't represent if there isn't a representative uh, group. So they're very very careful to make sure uh, that with respect to gender, with respect to um, ethnicity. Uh, the group of people that they're bringing in to do um, uh, the item writing is representative of whatever the population is that they're generalizing to. Uh, and for item review, 
uh, especially looking for all the various biases, it's way overrepresented by, dis by folks from disadvantaged groups uh, because that's really the voice that you're looking you know, to, to hear from. And I'll agree with my colleague. There are a lot of good people doing a lot of hard, rigorous work to produce what you saw. And I, you know, and, 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 and I don't, you know, I, I want to emphasize that. And folks of color are involved. But I don't think folks of color would respond well, who, who are involved would respond well if they saw this analysis. And, you know, I'll, I'll ask ETS if they'll invite me in. Like, not a chance in hell, but <laughs> we, we could see. I had a comment over here. So I was just curious, um, you know, to both of you, sort of the, so they used the exam, but they also used other measure, placement measures in order to determine where students best fit. It sounds like a lot of those people who are, you know, test pushers um, <laughs> think that it should be like a cutoff always. Like if you don't score X, then you can't do Y. Um, and I was just curious for your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, quickly I can respond. Multiple measures are the way to go. And the problem with what you saw is when it's in a high stakes situation with lots of weight placed on the SAT or ACT or GRE or LSAT that the problem, uh, uh, in the, the, the impact of the problem increases. I don't know if you have a, a thought Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to add a whole lot to that. I mean, we, we know that multiple measures uh, works better. Multiple measures has to work better. It's sort of a mathematical um, certainty. Uh, right, if you, you know, we can explain a certain amount of the variance with one, uh, with one variable. If we bring in a second variable, uh, it can't explain less, right? It can only explain more. So, um, so right, so we know that, that multiple measures, I mean, the question there, and across system, it, it's complicated in part by, by data and what data different entities have available to them, but there are a number of campuses that are using multiple measures um, and uh, it, right, the you know the question always is what what measures, um, but uh, but that is something, and I, I think most people in testing would tell you whether it's uh, you know our tests or you know ACT SAT uh, that for most of these tests that the developers really aren't envisioning that they're used in a vacuum. Uh, it tends to be that that sometimes they are, um, but I don't think that it's it's the test developers who are necessarily pushing that and saying, if you use this, it can be the only thing that, that you consider, because that's, that's not good measurement. Let me talk just, uh, since we only have a few minutes left, let me talk just a little bit. And thanks for your, your contribution and your, and your question and, and all of your questions. Let me just talk a little bit about affirmative action and the basketball coaches, since there might be some basketball fans here. Um, in terms of affirmative action, well, I'll tie those two together. Um, I have been the SAT and ACT consultant to the men's college basketball coaches for about 19 years. And the men's college basketball coaches are interested in the SAT and ACT because their students, incoming athletes, need a certain score combined with a grade point average to qualify and be eligible to play as freshmen at, at, in Division I and Division II. So I give talks to the coaches every year. And uh, a coach moved to, a coach from UCLA, whom I knew, moved to um, Michigan in 2006 uh, to become the, he was an assistant coach of uh, African-American guy, Ernie Ziegler is his name, um, moved to uh, become the head coach at Central Michigan. And I was talking to him and I asked him about Prop 2, which in 2006 was on the Michigan ballot. It was a statewide proposition that would abolish affirmative action. And there have been a number of these in a number of states, starting in California in 1996. So in 2006 in Michigan, and this uh, black coach said to me, Jay, what's Prop 2? Explain it to me. 
And I said, well, it uh, would abolish affirmative action. And he said, wait a second, is that like Prop 209 in California? I said, yes. And he said, you know, at UCLA, the black basketball coaches, uh, black basketball uh, players would come up to me and say, coach, I don't see many folks who look like me on campus. UCLA's black and Latino populations had plummeted after affirmative action was abolished in, in uh, 1996. So Ernie Ziegler said to me, is there anything we can do about this Michigan initiative? Because I'd like to oppose it. And I said, let's get the coaches to oppose it. So the men's basketball coaches, the women's basketball coaches, and the black coaches and administrators organizations all passed resolutions opposing Michigan's Prop 2. We had a press conference, got some good energy going. You know, unfortunately, the proposition passed by a pretty considerable margin and affirmative action was abolished in Michigan. But I realized that the coaches really got affirmative action and understood the importance of it. And I got the coaches to um, oppose every, initiative, every state initiative that came up after 2006. And unfortunately, there were several uh, in places like Nebraska and Oklahoma and Arizona. Um, so cut to 2013, and the Fisher affirmative action case was in the Supreme, uh, was granted certiorari by the Supreme Court, which meant they were going to hear it. This is a University of Texas case. I could give you some details if you're interested. Um, and I contacted the coaches and I said, you should file an amicus brief. Um, this is totally consistent with what we've been doing to oppose the initiatives in various states. And a really great brief was written by a Penn Law professor, um, as I referred to before, um, by, uh, submitted by the NABC, the National Association, of Bas National Association of Basketball Coaches, the WBCA, Women's Basketball Coaches, and the BCA, Black Coaches and Administrators, representing 12,000 coaches. And it was signed by 40, individually by 43 co coaches, including Tom Izzo of your rival Michigan State. Um, Tubby Smith and some others. Um, so uh, what's, what's interesting about this process and, and the reason that I, that I tie, uh, try to tie them all together is affirmative action really is made necessary by the weight put on the SAT and the ACT. And that's not my opinion. I, you know, I could give you some citations. Mar Marta Tienda, the American Sociological Review and stuff, came to that conclusion. And the coaches understand the importance of affirmative action. And their interest is bringing basketball players onto their campus who have a good, diverse undergraduate experience and see at least some students who look like them and that wasn't happening and doesn't happen today in places like UCLA and, and Berkeley, where, where the number of black students is infinitesimal. And the number of uh, uh, Latino students is way, way, way below the population, you know, percentage in the population, particularly considering the dramatic growth in that particular subgroup. Um, so coaches understand the importance of the SAT they not only understand the importance of affirmative action, but they've stuck their necks out. I've had coaches, <coughs> had a coach who participated in Colorado. Colorado is the only state, by the way, where a state initiative uh, banning affirmative action was defeated. And it was a particular uh, set of circumstances. Barack Obama was on the ballot for the first time. And so that was a, a unique situation. But I had some coaches I, I had coaches who, who signed statements in favor of affirmative action where their own board of trustees were in Colorado specifically were split on the issue. So I had coaches with some guts who stuck their necks out um, um, to support affirmative action in ways that I think are really cool. So I was going to delve into that a little bit more, but we got, we got pretty deep in the weeds, and, which is a good thing in, in, in uh, test question selection. But any questions or comments on that? Because we're, uh, we're, we're close to one, aren't we? We're close to one, yeah. Any, any, uh, any uh, parting comments, <laughs> questions? I'll hang around for 10 or 15 minutes if somebody wants to talk uh, individually. Um, but uh, I've had great experiences with the coaches on, on uh, really doing, doing the right thing uh, in, in terms of, in my opinion, in terms of 
uh, supporting affirmative action, and trying to make the campuses really good, welcoming, diverse places uh, for their players. And, I, and, and somebody, somebody asked one of the coaches at a, at a press conference once, well, isn't, isn't, affirmative, isn't supporting affirmative action a way that you can get better players? And the coach said, you know, I'm after five or six players a year. I'll get my players. That's not the problem. The problem is I want a really, I want the best possible environment to bring my players into. It's not getting the players. It's having my players have a rich, wonderful undergraduate experience. So I, with I that, have, we. I, well, I have a question. I mean, sure. We're at one, so I'm sure. Yeah, if any, anyone has to leave, we understand. Uh, is there a way to briefly just talk about um, why institute, 100 or plus institutions are starting to de-emphasize this test? And is there a component to that that you haven't touched on um, that is, is the explanation behind that? Because that moves us a little bit from how they're created into how they're used and yes. the policy implications um, or policy requirements around change. Yes. Well, there, let, me, let me describe it this way. I, I see two countervailing forces. I see the force of bubble tests becoming more important and more powerful in K-12 with the common core testing. That's just around the corner. Park and smarter balanced. You're going to, you're, there's lots of turmoil in the states about how much weight is going to be put on those tests in terms of graduation requirements. So you have increasing power and impact and influence from bubble tests emerging from that sector. And the countervailing is the increasing number of test optional colleges who take the position, send us a test score or not, we don't care, we're going to make a good decision either way. And those ranks were just added, uh, as you mentioned, by Temple, Bryn Mawr, Wesleyan. Um, it's, it's three, four, five uh, colleges or universities a year now um, who are going in that direction um, because they do their own internal studies and they determine that the test score isn't giving them the kind of value that they thought it was in making dis decisions. There's one college that's um, uh, test resistant, or you can, co I, Hampshire College in New York says, like, please don't send us a test score. <laughs> like, we don't want one. But uh, the test optional colleges say, send it to us or not, it's a piece of information. If you think it benefits you, we'll look at it. We're not bothered or concerned at all if you don't, if, if you don't send, uh, send it to us. And that's a growing movement. So you have, you know, this is a dynamic domain, and you have certain areas where, where things are getting uh, uh, more impactful and certain areas where the tests are somewhat less impactful, and test optional is a good example of that. Yes? With these test optional schools getting that higher education and stratifying their rankings, yes. are these test optional schools schools that will be considered low selectivity or mid-selectivity? There are a lot of low selectivity. Okay. Um, there are some mint selectivity, and there are a surprising number of selective colleges. Uh, Wesleyan, Bates, Bowdoin, Wake Forest, um, all highly selective. Um, Pitzer in California, um, uh, there are more and more. What we're not seeing is um, um, the people say that if a couple IV Stanford type schools would go test optional. That would change the game, and I think it would. Um, the state institutions like this one are answerable to more politi political constituencies like legislators and the like. So, so the route that Wisconsin would take to go test optional would, would be much harder than, than, a, than, a, than a private university. Um, but. Um, so, so, those are, so those are some of the factors at play. So in answer to your question, yes, there are a couple of dozen highly selective undergraduate institutions that are test optional. Yes? Thank you. Thank you. So would the, would the test makers describe their intent in selecting the questions the way they do as you described their intent? And if not, how would they describe it? Uh, how would they describe it? Well, they certainly don't describe anything the way I describe it. We describe things much different. I just have totally different perspectives. 
Um, they're trying to generate what they feel is a, is a useful and fair instrument, and they feel they do that. And I say it's, it's not useful and certainly not, really not fair, and, and, and that's, that's where we differ. Would they, though, describe, as I heard you describe the way they go about choosing questions, kind of get the most questions that the students we define as best will do well? Well, that's the point by serial correlation, right. and, and our colleague said that there are other consider, that's, that's one of several considerations. And there's lots of rigor, and there's, there's, there's lots of good people doing lots of hard work to generate what you saw, and that's, that's, I find, unfortunate, actually. But would they say out loud, yeah, that's actually, that is the way we do it, or that's one serious consideration. We want the questions that the best students do the best on to populate the test. Well, they wouldn't describe it like that. That's my layperson description of biserial uh, correlation. Right, and they would say that certainly, as far as discrimination is concerned, they would be interested, it's not just that the best students are doing the best on it, because it could just be a really easy question and everybody does well. Right. Right. So discrimination goes up when there's a, you know, s small differences, you know, a as someone gets uh, a little bit more uh, higher achieving, um, that corresponds to, to bigger and bigger differences on, in terms of performance. So really a big difference between, you know, how do the, how do the, the top students do, how do the, the lower end students do, and looking at that difference. And yeah, maximizing that difference is certainly one of the, uh, you know, could be one of the considerations that we know if that difference is small, um, then for most tests it's better intended to create variance, you know. But it's not, uh, they're certainly not, um, uh, you know, looking at subgroup, they're not doing that as a subgroup analysis that's based on, you know, the entire population. Just they expect that the top students do, do well, they get these right pretty frequently, the lower end students do, uh, you know, do less well on those items, um, and the item is written though from a. I mean, the reason the item is written, what motivates it, it is, uh, you know, it's placed within a test blueprint, with measuring a certain piece of uh, the construct that, that they do. Yeah, but the math question that I showed you, I wonder what the construct was there, because that was just a goofy math well, question. The, con the construct though, it doesn't have to. I mean, it it appears as you know, as if you're asking. You know, can you recognize middle digits of numbers? But it's but it's not that at all. I mean, it's it's an elementary division question, right? And the notion you're dividing something by three, um, and so there's just a little bit of reasoning because if you came at this and you asked the question, whatever it was, 453 divided by three equals, uh, you're much more limited in terms of your options because you want your answers to be things that uh, that that might tap into you know misinformation. Uh, that, that people, if they make a mistake, that they're going to find their answer among the choices. Right, right, right. So <laughs> it, it's, it's sort of, I actually think it's kind of a clever way to test base, the basic concept of division within a, a fairly self-contained environment, mm. providing uh, a, there's a greatly reduced subset of choices, right? So they're selecting some of those, so the odds are that someone who's missed you know, who's doing math wrong is, is going to find their answer. Yeah, I, I actually would yeah. agree with you uh, on that. One cautionary instruction to folks, particularly women and folks of color, I showed you some depressing stuff. There's also what's known as an intervention, which is if you're going to take the GRE or LSAT or GMAT or MCAT or anything like that in the future, get some test prep. Get prepared. You can surmount lots of these differences by getting yourself ready. You're not, you're not limited to the average. You can be an above average performer. And I always like to do that cautionary instruction uh, to folks who would get otherwise overly depressed by, by what they saw. But thanks lots very much. Lots to talk Lisa. about, and I think we need to wrap up. And thanks, Jay. Thank you. Thank you, folks.